All right, so I started, a, I gave a, a, an overview of eschatology, the study of last days, last week, so that we could get started now in the book of Revelation. I'm covering these last chapters because I've covered a lot of the earlier chapters and other teachings over the years. I want to really focus on these last four chapters of Revelation because there's so much powerful teaching that comes out of these um, chapters. So we're going to be teaching, and um, there's going to be some guest speakers along the way uh, ministering other messages because I'm going to be out of town. Um, but we're going to cover these. I'll be finishing up in the middle of November, and we're going to go verse by verse through Revelation 19, 20, 21, and 22. Um, and so today we're going to cover the first 10 verses of chapter 19. Like many of you here, I was taught only a secret rapture, that we were going to escape seven years in advance. We were going to escape the Great Tribulation, and we were going to escape the Antichrist. And the churches that I grew up in, and that's all we thought, we all we believed, that that's what they said, that was what their teaching was. I didn't question it. All the books I had, um, the Hal Lindsey books, I had read the Hal Lindsey books, I knew all about the Left Behind series and all that, so that was all I was taught. I had no other background. But something really bothered me. I could not explain the teaching to others. It wasn't that I didn't understand it. I, I know what Hal Lindsey said. I know what he talks about. And I know what Tim LaHaye teaches. And I know what Wilbur teaches. And all the, the pre-rapture, secret rapture teachers. I know what they teach. And I could explain it to you on a chart. chart but I couldn't explain it from here. And that was my problem. So, there... There was, a man, there was a pastor here from the Assemblies of God, the Assemblies of God denomination. A lot of my friends are Assemblies of God people, and they're my friends, and I love them, and I don't hold anything against them for believing that, but that denomination, they will not allow you to teach unless you believe the secret rapture. They, you cannot be a pastor in the Assemblies of God unless you believe in the secret rapture. But those are the Assemblies of God pastor. They gathered together with us, with a bunch of pastors, for prayer years ago. And this is amazing to me. He evangelized, not with tracts, not with preaching the gospel. He evangelized with left-behind novels. So he would hand out novels, and, and he would tell people, you need to get saved so you won't have to face the Antichrist. You need to get saved so you can escape the Great Tribulation. And he led a lot of people with that. I would just call it a fear tactic. He, he said, you've got to get saved so you won't have to face and you might get the mark of the beast. You, you don't want to do that. You, 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 you don't want that pressure on you to, whether you're going to receive the mark of the beast. So he led a lot of people with a message of escape and, and you don't want to face the Antichrist and you don't want to get the mark of the beast and all that. And so he, he, and he told these pastors that we need to get more of the left behind novels in the people's hands. So they can know to escape from what's coming. And so he said he led a lot of people to the Lord. <clears throat> I have found that Christians who are raised under the system have to be detoxed from all that this teaching gives us. They have to be detoxed. I had to be, it took me years to detox myself out of this teaching. Because that's all I had ever been taught. And I'm going to tell you this with, with total conviction. It will affect every part of your theology. Total. Every part of your theology will be affected by it. It's a system of interpretation that's all wrong. And, and it's hard to tell people that because so many well-known people believe it. So many educated Christians, so many people that love the Lord believe it. And I'm going to tell you, eschatology is the area of theology that is the worst doctrine that we have in the body of Christ. By far. Every step, and we do the false teaching seminar with pastors, and I, and I always tell them, eschatology is the worst. We, we have the salvation is in Jesus. We have Trinity down right. We have a lot of these things down right. 
But we have eschatology all messed up, especially if people believe this teaching. And I know last week I saw some people, because I know that you're new to our church and you don't know what the early church taught, and you don't know what the creeds teach, and you don't know what we've been teaching. So I, I, I startled some people last week with my teaching. So, uh, and that was good. I'm glad I messed up your theology a little bit. <laughs> so what I'm going to do each, each week whenever I'm teaching, I'm going to take about five minutes or so, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to help you talk some of you. I, I'm going to detox you of this system, and I'm going to show you where it came from, and I'm going to show you how it affects your theology. So, and if you look at the bulletin, I'm writing articles in the bulletin about where we got the speaker rapture, and I'm, I'm getting you all the background and all that. And, and so I did all the study back in the 90s. I spent seven years studying this. Uh, put thousands of hours of time and spent thousands of dollars acquiring books and writings and everything to find out where did we get this teaching because it certainly was not something that was in the early church and it's not a foundational teaching. So I said this last week, none of the creeds, no early church creed, no doctrinal statement by any of the Christian denominations over the first 1,800 years, believed this teaching, this left behind Hal Lindsey secret rapture teaching. None of them, none of them believed it. Okay? And as we said last week, Jesus is only coming once. That's the clear teaching of the Bible. If you have him coming twice, you're going to be all confused. I promise you, you'll be confused. So none of them, none of them, you, you look at any creed, any, any writer, in the early church, nobody ever taught a secret rapture. They, all the early church people, the first 300 years, they all taught that we were going to face Antichrist, we were going to be persecuted, but that the Lamb has conquered. They lived in Revelation. The Lamb has conquered, so we win. You realize that, that if, if, if even the devil has been put under our feet, the Antichrist is, is the servant of, of the devil. So I, we're not afraid of Antichrist. We're not afraid of, of the beast. We're not afraid of any of that. We're not. So where did we get this teaching? Once again, I said this last week. In November of 1832, a man named John Nelson Darby, part of the Plymouth Brethren, uh, he was not the main leader. Later, later on, he became the main leader. But John Nelson Darby began to teach that Jesus was coming twice, coming secretly. That was never in the church. That was never a part of church doctrine in any of the first 1,800 years. Uh, Darby was never married. He was a lawyer. Graduated from the University of Trinity in Dublin, Ireland. He was Irish. <clears throat> and so in 1832, he began to teach at a mansion, a very famous mansion that's just south of Dublin. He began to teach that Jesus was going to come twice now. Nobody had ever taught this. There were some really big name leaders. You might just not know some of these guys, but back in the 1800s, these guys were really big leaders that were part of the Plymouth Brethren. Uh, one's George Mueller. He's the guy from Bristol who founded the orphanage and fed thousands of orphans for, for many, many years. Very powerful man. Has a very powerful testimony about prayer. Uh, there was another man named Benjamin Wilkes Newton who was the head of the Plymouth Brethren. And he wrote a lot of books on prophecy. So I have his books on prophecy and end time prophecy. And he believes what I'm teaching you today. Um, same theology. <coughs> But the main guy that teaches us what Darby taught, where we get all the historical information, was Dr. Samuel Tregellis. Uh, Tregellis was a Hebrew scholar and Greek scholar, probably the main Hebrew teacher uh, in the body of Christ in the 19th century, was Dr. Tregellis. He, he wrote dictionaries on Hebrew and Greek, very saintly man. And he wrote a book called The Hope of Christ's Second Coming in 1864. And I have the book. This is a, a modern version of it, but he wrote it in 1864. The thing that makes Pagelis so critical in all this historical understanding is that he was there in the meetings when Darby started teaching the speaker rapture. So he, uh, in this book, tells definitely that Darby taught the secret rapture was Christ's second coming, and then seven years later, our little Darby originally thought it would be 100 years or 70 years. They finally settled on seven years. 
seven years before the end, the church was going to come be raptured out. That would be the second coming. And then when Jesus came again at the end of the age, that was the third coming. So he, he taught it that way. Darby said it was the second coming, then a third coming. Well, guess what? What do, what do you think all these main leaders did? They left the movement. Uh, and, and then Darby took it over. Darby took over the Plymouth Brethren movement. Because they thought, hey, this is wrong. But no, nobody's ever taught a second and a third coming of Jesus. And so a lot of people opposed Darby and uh, what he was doing. But Darby was a very strong-willed man. He was a lawyer, argued very effectively, wrote even a, his own translation of the Bible called the Darby Bible. So you may have seen that, uh, seen that before. Um, <clears throat> but uh, these guys all left the movement at that time. Uh, Charles Spurgeon called the Darbyites a cult. He said they were a cult because they were teaching a lot of very strange teaching beyond this teaching. He was, Darby, was, Darby was teaching a lot of very strange things about Jews and all that. So, what did he do? I said this last week. When Jesus comes, he wraps his church. That was the teaching that was in the church. Thank you, brother. For 1,800 years, very simple teaching. He's only coming once. And you get that? Man, you guys got to give each other a high five. That's it. You're done. You, you, you got it. He comes in glory and power with all the angels, with six the, the heavens, the, with lightning. Visibly, he's coming visibly. He's not coming secretly. You can't hide something like that. has all the glory. You can't hide that. So he's coming powerfully. He's not coming halfway down, putting on the brakes, and then turning around going back up. That's all the false teaching. So Darby moved it forward seven years. And we've got now this other teaching. So how did Darby correct second teaching, third teaching? Well, they said, it's the same coming in two phases. It's the same coming in two stages. And so all these guys like Wolverd and LaHaye, they used that language. It came from Darby. Darby was the one that, that he had to figure out how to, you can't say second coming and third coming. So they, okay, it's one coming, but it's in two stages, two phases, seven years apart. I mean, that's strange. If I told you I was coming to your house after the service, and now I was coming seven years later, it's the same coming. Something's wrong with me. Like, what, what's wrong with your brain? You need to get a brain map because you're, you're messed up. But Daddy said Jesus was coming secretly and a rapture the church out. That's when the church gets raptured. And then seven years later, then the church was going to come. Uh, Jesus was going to come and, and, and judge the world. <clears throat> so where did we get the seven years? Because somebody asked me that. Where, where does this seven years come from? Where did Darby and the preacher of rapture teachers get this from. And I'm going to draw these, the main scriptures here just to read them off. First Corinthians 15, right, 50 to 55, the main teaching on the rapture. You get a new body at the last trumpet, the corruptible is going to put on incorruption, the mortal immortal, immortality, all that. First Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 17, you know, when the Lord descends at the last trump, the voice of the archangel, all that. Uh, dead in Christ arise first, that's rapture, language, First Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Uh, when the Lord comes to gather us together, another rapture verse. Philippians 3, 20, 21, that's when we get the glorified body, same body like Jesus' body. The rapture is not about escape or escaping out of Christ, it's about getting a new resurrected body, that's all it's about. Uh, John 14, verses 2 to 3, you know, God's the Lord has a mansion, he's preparing a place for you. He's going to come and receive you unto himself. Rapture language again. Then Corinthians, you know, we're not uh, uh, this earthly tent that we're in. We've got to lay it aside. We want to be clothed with a heavenly dwelling. That's all rapture language. We're going to get a new body. Revelation 20, we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. The first resurrection. It's the first resurrection way at the end the first resurrection. If it's the first resurrection, there can't be any one before. You can't have it seven years before because it's the first resurrection at the end. And then we saw these verses last week, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Jesus sends the angels and we all get, uh, we're gathered together to the Lord. All that's your language. Here's what bothered me. Here's what put me into this study for seven years 
and wrote this book on the end times. By the way, who, who, I, as long as you promise to read it, okay, and I'm going to question you, I'm going to have homework and a quiz. It's going to be a quiz, but I'll give you my book on the end times for free. Who, who would like it? Right here. Come. You, you need it too, by the way. I'm gonna get, yeah, I'm just going to get out. I'm going to get a copy for you after the service. Um, here's what cost me to go do all this study. None of these verses, and all the verses, there's a whole bunch of verses on the rapture. There's verses in the Old Testament on the rapture. There's more verses than this in the New Testament on the rapture. Guess what? None of them mention seven years. It never mentions the time, except what we said last week, the last day, the last trumpet, the end of the age. You never find a time in these verses, in any verse on the rapture. I, I have a book right now called, that I'm writing out, I've already outlined it, it's called 30 Days on the Rapture, it's a devotional through the rapture, and we look at every verse on the rapture, none of them ever mention time. None of them ever mention three and a half years seven years, nothing like that, but they do say the last day, the last trumpet, the end of the age. It never says seven years before. So, that's what bothered me. They're teaching me seven years, seven years, seven years, and I've got to be broken like, where's the seven years? I don't think seven years. Somebody help me. It doesn't say seven years. And that's what bugged me. That's what bugged me. So that's when I went to the library. I went to the library. <laughs> to find out what was going on. So I got my computer. Okay. Seven years. Look for all the verses that have seven years. I found one verse in the New Testament. All 27 books, my computer scanned it. There was one verse that had seven years. And it happened to be Luke 2.36. And it was about Anna who lived with her husband for seven years before he died. That was the only thing. And that's not about the rapture, so it can't be there. So where did Darby and the secret rapture teachers get seven years? Huh, you guys know. Where did they get it? Huh? Imagination? Okay. <laughs> oh, come on. You guys are better than... How long have you been serving the Lord? Where, where did they get it? Where did they get seven years from? Daniel? Okay. Thank you, brothers. You know, we want to stay here today. <laughs> Daniel 9. Oh, you're, you're really saved. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this right now. Without Daniel 9.27, you and I would not have this discussion today. There's one verse that this whole system works if that verse wasn't in the Bible, the whole, there would be no, there would be no secret actor. We would not have this discussion today. There would be no left behind novels. How Lindsay would have to have another profession because he would not write the way great planet Earth. There's only one verse. And here's the shocking thing is that John Wilbert, he's since passed away, president of Dallas Theological Seminary, which is the headquarters of the secret rapture teaching. All the guys, uh, J. Vernon McGee, how long we graduated from there, John Wilbur, Paul Riley, all those guys, Dwight Pentecost, they're all professors from this school. They're the secret rapture headquarters. That's, that, that's where everybody gets their teaching, is from these guys. From these guys, uh, John Wilbur. John Wilbur is the main scholar and theologian of this secret rapture teaching. He wrote 60 books on prophecy, all of them preaching the secret rapture. 60 books. Promoting the secret actor. And then it, I, 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 I got this book, The Rapture Question by Wilbur. Page 148, he states in there, okay, I have to admit, I appreciate his honesty. I have to admit, you can't find the seven years in any verse. <laughs> he said that. He said that on page 148. I'm quoting it. Go by his book if you want to. Go to page 148, and it says that you can find it nowhere in the Bible. The guy who wrote 16 books on prophecy, the main scholar and theologian of the secret master, admits that you can't find it in the Bible. That's shocking. That's embarrassing. Thank you. Don't listen to me. 
He did it right here. The so whole enchilada is writing on this one verse. I think Daniel would have not written this verse. It would save me a lot of trouble. Daniel 9, 27. And, and tell me if you find in this verse the rapture, the Antichrist, uh, the day of the Lord, the second coming. Tell me if you find anything in this verse. I'm going to read it to you. Tell me if you find it. Then he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Yeah, tell me if you find seven years in here. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Now, that is so cryptic. I have no idea what Daniel's trying to say right like there. In my end time book, I read a whole chapter on Daniel 9, 27, and, I, and we do that whole interpretation of those verses from 20 down to 27. This one week, they make it into seven years, which is acceptable, but you don't see Antichrist, you don't see the beast, you don't see the little horn, you don't see anything like that. There's nothing about the second coming in that verse, yet that's the verse they use to get to seven years. Now, here, so this there's nothing about the rapture. There's nothing about the second coming. There's nothing about the day of the Lord. That says nothing about Israel. <laughs> and it says nothing about the Antichrist. So here, here is how they do it. Here's how they wrote these books. Here's how they write their, their books. They take all those verses on the rapture and they insert a, a seven years to each one of them. So they, put, they, they inserted it, you know, they're okay, see, the, there it is, right there, seven years. You see that? You see that? You got, you, you put it right in there, right there. Put the seven years right in there. So they, they put Daniel 9, 27, and they put it into all those verses. Not Daniel 9, 27, seven years. Do you see, do you see the seven years? Yeah, you see the seven years in these verses? No, we don't see it. There is no seven years in any of those verses. And the verse we're using doesn't tell you about the rapture. And over says it's not in the Bible. <laughs> I keep preaching this. Keep it still. I don't know. I still have my hell easy book. Okay, where's the Lord? <laughs> get a job. <laughs> Go get a job. So that's my short introduction. Now let's go to the verse. Take your Bible. Go to Revelation 19. I don't want to talk to you about the rapture today. I want to talk to you about the God who reigns. And we ought to say, Hallelujah! Those songs we sang today about praise the Lord! Jesus, you know, all those songs were beautiful. This is what I want to talk about today. This is a worship book. We ought to read it for worship. It's powerful. So let me just give you this quick overview. In chapter 19, Babylon is burned in the fire. Especially verse 8. I'm oh, sorry, chapter 18. Chapter 18, Babylon gets burned. Chapter 19, the beast and the false prophet get cast into the lake of fire. And the beast army is destroyed. In chapter 20, the devil gets cast into the lake of fire. And everybody in his name is not in the Lamb's Book of Life. So you get Babylon destroyed in chapter 18. You get the beast and false father destroyed in the fire. And then you get the devil destroyed in the fire. And anybody else who's not following the Lamb. There's a lot of fire going on. And as you read through the book of Revelation, you're going to find a bunch of tombs. There's two multitudes in chapter 7. There's two demonic hordes in chapter 9. There's two witnesses in chapter 11. There's two beasts in chapter 13. There's two harvests in chapter 14. There's two enemies of God in chapter 17. There's two cities in chapter 18. There's two cups in chapter 14 and 17. And here in chapter 19, you're going to find in verse 9, there's a supper there in verse 9. And then if you go look, over here at verse uh, 17, there's another supper. There's two suppers. There's two suppers. You can go to dinner in two different places. There's two suppers. 
in the first supper, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb, Christians will eat. In the next supper, which is the great supper, the supper of the great God, the vultures are going to eat. In the first banquet, it's for the believers. The second banquet, unfortunately, is for the unbelievers. In the first banquet, in the first banquet, we are going to eat. In the second banquet, the wicked are going to be eaten. There's two suppers here. And as you know, as you read through the book of Revelation, there's two cities that show up. There's two cities. One is Babylon, and one is the New Jerusalem. And you're either in one city or the other. Our citizenship, Paul said, is in heaven. Right before he talked about the last thing, our citizenship is in heaven. We're waiting for a Savior from there, and when he comes, he has the power to change our lowly bodies into his glorious body. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. We are part of the new Jerusalem. We come to the heavenly Jerusalem. We come to the Jerusalem that is above. There's a Jerusalem below. The Galatians says there's a Jerusalem above. Hebrews 12, 22 says we come to the heavenly Jerusalem, and we find out that I, you and I, the believers in Jesus Christ, we're part of the citizenship of the new Jerusalem, the city of God. And if you're part of the wicked, you're part of Babylon, you're part of that city, that's who you are a citizen of. That's the lonely people, the unsaved people. I'm not in the Babylon, I'm in Jerusalem with the Lord. And that's the carefully, this happens a lot in the book of Revelation, and it causes confusion for people. Things change in the book of Revelation. What used to be a city turns into something else. If you go book, uh, for example, we did this teaching a few, maybe a couple years ago in Revelation 12. Revelation 12 is the greatest chapter on the devil. If you want to learn about the devil, go to Revelation 12. It's an incredible chapter about the devil. At the beginning of the chapter, he's a dragon. And by the end of the chapter, he's a, he turns into a serpent. That's common in, in apocalyptic imagery and literature. You turn from one thing into another, but you still know it's the same person. It was a dragon before, but then he turns into a serpent, and then he turns back into a dragon. Go read that whole chapter. Well, guess what? These two cities, by the time you get to the end of Revelation, they turn into women. One becomes a prostitute, and the other one becomes a lamb's wife. I don't want to be part of the prostitute. I want to be part of the Lamb's wife, the bride of Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about here. The marriage is come, verse 7. The marriage of the Lamb, the Lamb's going to get married. His wife has come first because he's ready. You know when you start a wedding? I, I, I have officiated a lot of weddings as a pastor over the last 35 years. You know what? You know what it starts? It's not when the last person walks in. The wedding starts when the bride's ready. We're waiting for the bride. The whole thing is waiting for her. If you still have to do something, getting your hair done, maybe you better sit down and pull out your soda because we're going to wait before the bride comes in. The bride has to be ready before everything gets going. You don't know what the way it is. And that's what John says to her. The bride has made herself ready. Is ready. That's when the wedding is to start. I'm going to give it to you right now. I'm going to give you the whole entire right here, right now. Why did God create the whole universe? Why did why? It's a mess right now. <laughs> why did He create it? Why knowing that there was going to be a devil? Why knowing that Adam was going to fall? Why did He create this? Why did He do this? He did it for one reason. And, and the, way, the reason you can tell what, is what, it's where everything is going, it's where the whole history is going. All of history is going in that direction. And all you have to do is look at the last chapters of the book of Revelation, you can see that everything is going to something. We're all heading somewhere. 
were all heading to a wedding. Why did God create the universe? Because Jesus is single and he needs to get married to his wife. That's the whole purpose. God is looking for a people who will love him and be pure and be holy and be part of the bride because the Father is looking for a wife for the Son. The whole, whole purpose of creation is the Father wanted a wife for Jesus. And he only wants it to be pure and holy and without thought and without wrinkle, a glorious earth so that he could marry the glorious Lord. The Lamb is going to get married. But you realize that the whole heart of creation is a divine romance. Gene Edwards wrote a book called The Divine Romance. That's where I got it from, by the way, Gene Edwards. I wanted to say it was my revelation, but I got it from Gene Edwards. The Divine Romance, that's a great book. You should read it by Gene Edwards, the writer, the Christian writer. The whole creation is a love affair between the Son and the God. It's all about love. The purity of love. What do you that's what God is looking for. That's his part of the bride. Those who genuinely, truly love Jesus over everything. I want to be a part of that bride. I want to be a part of I want to be a part of the Lamb's wife. And that's the saying that I have all the time. We're heading for a wedding. Everybody, and here, here, uh, I know some of this right here, you're going to see it in the parables too when you go through all the parables. You see all the parables? Of the, of the virgin and the Jesus and the bridegroom and, and Matthew 22, the, there's a parable of the king who has a son and he's looking for it and he sends out guests and invites them in. One minute you're the bride, the next minute you're the invited guest, but you're still part of the bride. You're still going to a wedding. It's okay that you're the bride and that you're the guest. It doesn't make any sense in, in, in a natural wedding, but in what God wants to do, it makes total sense. Man, I got away from my notes. I don't even know where I am. <laughs> you just help me. <laughs> well, I messed it all up already. Just throw all these notes. <laughs> I really did study this. Let's run. Let's get back to the text here. I'm, I got too excited there. <laughs> After these things. Those three words, John uses it a lot in the book of Revelation. What, what, what was going on after these things? And it was after verses 21 through 34, the, pre, uh, the previous chapter. This mighty angel throws down this snowstone and he says, Babylon, it's falling. It's, it's coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down. It's not going to be there anymore. No more. It's gone. Verse 22, you're not going to find it there anymore. There's going to be no more. That's the easy season of words. No more. There's no more. Verse 22, you can't be hurt in there anymore. There won't be light in there anymore. You see that? You can't be a bride. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be hurt there anymore. It's the easy season of words. You won't find it anymore. Now the water is coming down. It's falling. The smoke is rising up. And wherever the smoke there is, Fire is coming down. He says, I heard a loud voice of a grand multitude in heaven. Now we're in heaven. You see the same kind of language in verse 6. Look, look at that. It says, a, vo- a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. And verse 6 says, and I heard of the word, the voice of a great multitude. Sounds like a clean language. Now, some commentators say, well, this great multitude in verse 1 is in heaven, because it says they're in heaven. And this multitude over here in verse 6 is on the earth. And I, I, I don't see it that way. I think it's the same multitude. I believe it's the believers in the Lord. But some commentators say it's, it includes all the angels. Or some just say it is all the angels. 
I, I think it's all the believers uh, who are believers in the Lord that is part of this great multitude. And the reason I believe it is all you have to do is look at Revelation chapter 7. This is the only other place where you see the phrase a great multitude. It's right here in verse 1, or I hear in verse uh, 6, but also in chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. It's on the, on the screen. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude with no one to number of all the nations, tribes, people, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. Remember that, because we're going to talk about the fine linen here in just a minute, here in chapter 19. With palm branches in their hands, and they were crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And you can find them right here, saying in chapter 19, verse 1, Hallelujah! Salvation belongs to the Lord. Can you see that? They're saying almost the same thing. And so, it can't be angels to me, because it says that it's from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, and all that, and, and they're wearing these white robes, which is going to be this fine linen we're going to see in verse 8 right now. So, that's my interpretation is that this great multitude of verse 1, great multitude of verse 6, it's the same multitude, and it's the believers in the Lord. That's what I believe. And I want you to notice something here in verse 1. You see the word they're saying? Saying, S-A-Y-I-N-G, saying. And if you look down at verse uh, <clears throat> 4, uh, it says, Spain, S-Y-I-N-G. And if you look at verse 5, it says, Spain. And then you look at verse 6, it says, Spain. You see, at third times, it says, Spain. Each word is a participle, and that means that they were saying this over and over and over and over again. John was sitting there, and it was like this wave. Uh, like verse 6, it says, The sound of many water, the sound of mighty thunder. Can you imagine millions and millions and a hundred million believers uh, worshiping God? How does that sound when we say it over and over again? How, how about if it's like 500 million people who believe in Jesus all saying that out loud? Man, that would be like waves and thunderings when we got to start saying it. That would be powerful. So they kept saying this. John was doing this over and over and over and over again. And they all use this beautiful word. It's the only place in the Bible that it comes up. It's the beautiful anthem. Wherever you hear it, everybody knows it. In verse 1, it's, Hallelujah! In verse 3, it's Hallelujah! In verse 4, it's Hallelujah! In verse 6, it's Hallelujah! <laughs> That's the Greek word, the Greek, the Hebrew word where it came from, as the word you guys all know, it's Hallelujah. But they say it four times, and this is where Handel's Messiah, they have the Hallelujah chorus in Handel's Messiah, it's right there. He got it from right here. This is the only place that this shows up. Now, in the Psalms, where many of the Psalms begin and end with, praise the Lord, and it closes out, praise the Lord. In the Hebrew, it's hallelujah. <laughs> That's the word. So, hallelujah, that word, when I, when I went to Jamaica, they used hallelujah. When I went to Haiti, they used hallelujah. When I went to Colombia, they used hallelujah. When I went to Mexico, they used hallelujah. I talked to another guy the other day from Indonesia. He was doing worship, and he said, hallelujah. Everybody knows hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah was not a word that was, I said hallelujah, and then you said hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. No, when you said hallelujah, it was a command to start praising God. Praise the Lord. So if somebody says hallelujah to me, I need to go, oh yeah, praise you Jesus, thank you Jesus, I love you Jesus, I thank you for saving me. That's what hallelujah means. It's a command, it's not a saying. When you say hallelujah, that means start praising God right now. Praise the Lord. That's why I love the worship service. When we do it, I go, God, oh, this is my service right here. Praise the Lord. And it's interesting that you hallelujah, 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 everybody's saying hallelujah. And in verse 5, 
He said, then I heard a voice from the throne saying, praise our God. That's what hallelujah means, praise the Lord. <laughs> and I have it written out, praise our God, but it means hallelujah. And they began all the time, hallelujah. At the end of verse 1, it says, salvation belongs to God. How many of you know salvation belongs to God? You can't get saved any other way but through God. Glory belongs to God. He deserves all the glory. Honor belongs to God. He deserves all the honor. And power belongs to God. He's all powerful. All power belongs to God. And we're going to get to it in just a minute in verse 6, where all the multitudes say, The Lord God, omnipotent, the one who has all power, He's the one that reigns. We're all power for what? Pontal Crapper is the same word that we're going to see next time I preach in verse 15. It says, Almighty God. Same word is omnipotent. I don't know why the New King James used omnipotent because every other place where it translates it is the word Almighty here in the book of Revelation. But salvation, glory, honor, power belong to the Lord. Our God. Isn't that beautiful? He's our God. The one that is almighty. He's my God. He's your God. The almighty one. The one who has all power. He's my God. For true and righteous, verse 2 says, are his judgments. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And I have then done her the blood of his servants shed by her. Isn't that something? It's his servants, capital A. His servants, God's servants have been killed by this harlot. And God's going to judge this harlot because he touched God's servants. There's one thing we know about God's judgments is they're always true. And they're always right. He's a just God. People have asked me over the years about certain people. Do you think he went to heaven? Do you think he went? Do you think he went? I don't know. Was he saved? Was, was that, that guy that was drunk all the time? Do you think he went to heaven? Or this guy or that guy? Or do you think he went to heaven? Can I tell you, you should never worry about that. Number one, you're not the judge, he is. But number two, whether he gets in or not, the judgment is going to be right. You can rest assured on that. If he got in, it's because the Lord knew it was right and he was right. And if he didn't get in and he went to hell, it's because the Lord said he's right. God is right. He's going to go to hell. I never worry about whether somebody made it or not. It's not my decision. And all I know is, whatever God's decision is about it, He's true and He's right. And I can rest in that. I never have to worry about it. God's judgments are always true. And they're always right. He's never wrong. He's a good God. And He's a good judge. And He's going to do what is right. And he's going to do what is true. And I praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> Babylon is going to be judged. <clears throat> and right before, in chapter 16, right before all the bowls of wrath of judgment get poured out, John says this, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. You know what? When we see judgment on the earth, Many of us, we could just say, oh, that's so hard, that's so bad, that's so terrible, whatever. But we need to say it was true and it was right. Because God is the one that's doing it. And we should celebrate. It seems kind of odd that Christians would celebrate something bad happening. But this is something good for us because now the great heart that has uh, persecuted us 
the great harlot, the persecution that we uh, uh, had, and that many Christians over the centuries have been killed because of the world ways and worldly people and people influenced by the devil have persecuted us and said, oh, God, we ought to celebrate. God says, go ahead and celebrate because I'm judging her. Isn't that beautiful when the children of Israel came out of out of uh, the cross, the Red Sea, and they got on the other side, other side, and God crushed all the enemies, and the water came back, and they were all flowing there. You remember what Miriam did? Ninety something year old woman. She was in her nineties. She pulled out a tambourine, and all the girls started dancing on the other side. Woohoo! Yeah, I will sing unto the Lord, for He is coming closely. The horsemen are on His throne, and to the sea that will not come. The horsemen are riding that throne into the sea, and they're celebrating that. Yeah, we can celebrate it because God's judgments are right. We're celebrating what He's doing. The world, the devil's not going to win in the end. They're the biggest losers. They're the biggest losers. Their end is all fire and judgment. Don't be part of Babylon. Run as fast as you can from Babylon. The three says again, they. Who's they? It's the great multitude. In fact, where it says again in the Greek, it's uh, Deuteron, where we get the word second. So they said it a second time. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! They just said it in verse 1. Hallelujah! Now they said it again. Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. In other words, she's never going to get back up from this. Her Judgment is eternal. He's absolutely finally thrown down. Can I tell you something, brothers? Before you can see the bride, you've got to get rid of the whore. You can't see the bride until the whore moves out of the way. And that's one of the reasons we, that's why they're rejoicing. The wedding is going to be ready now because the prostitute is no longer around. Can I tell you what hinders us in worship? Is when you dabble in the world. You can't worship. You spend all your time on social media. Your mind is focused on that. That's your priority. You're all day on the phone. 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 You ought to be all day praising the Lord and worshiping the King. But we can't do that because all the worldly attractions have us running around with all the sexual stuff and perverted stuff and bad stuff and titillating stuff. All that stuff feeds us from the true worship of the living God. It ought to be judged and thrown down. This is so beautiful. One of the commentators that I read said, the, 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 the progression of the hallelujah here is in concentric circles. So we have the great multitude out here praising. And then if you go to Revelation 4, you see that the next people in line are the 24 elders praising. And then the ones that are closest are the four living creatures are praising. And then in the verse 5, there's a voice that comes from the very throne of God. So it keeps getting closer and closer and closer to the worship. You start out here with a great most the multitude, and then the 24 elders are praising the Lord, and the living creatures are worshiping Him, and then you get a sort of word from the throne of God that says, Praise God. This is the last time in verse 4 that you're going to see the 24 elders. And this is the last time you're going to see the four living creatures. If you go look, at every reference in the book of Revelation to the 24 elders, you know what they're doing every time? They're worshiping God. They're worshiping God. They're worshiping God. They're elders. They're presbyteros. They're old men with white beards. That's what presbyteros means. There's an old man with a white beard. And they have these gold crowns. It's not a crown like a king. It's a stephanos. The Greek word is stephanos. It's a wreath that they gave at the Olympic Games 
Whenever you want a gold medal, you got the victory. They put a stephanos the on your head. They do that today in the Olympics when you win the gold medal or the bronze or the silver. They put a stephanos wreath on your head. These guys who train forever have stephanos wreath, uh, um, gold wreath on their head. And what the uh, stephanos? The stephanos was wherever you got a victory, you got a stephanos. Wherever you won the victory, wherever you won the gold medal. And I remember what those 24 others did. When they got before the throne, they took off their katana and they threw them before the Lamb. You know, brothers, every victory we get is because of Jesus. You don't have a victory without Jesus. Every victory that you have accomplished is not because you were a good Christian and you did it the right way. The victory is because the Lamb has overcome. And we throw our Stephanos victory. Every victory we win, we ought to throw it at the feet of Jesus and say, It was because of you that we won. Because of Jesus. It wasn't because I did it right. It wasn't because I remember I'm right this. It wasn't because I had the right people pray for me. All of those things are good. All of those things are profitable. But the victory came because of the Lamb. Jesus gave us the victory. It's amazing, it is amazing to me how many people will have theological arguments about who these 24 elders are. Oh, they're 12 from the Old Testament, and they're 12 from the New Testament. It doesn't say that. Oh, some of them, they're angels. They're actually not men. They're superhuman people. They're, they're not really men. You know, if you go read the 24 elders, the supreme worshiper. And what you ought to learn from them is not who they are. You ought to know what they do. <laughs> they worship in the Father who sits on the throne. That's what you ought to learn about them. Who are trying to figure out who they are. We don't know who they are. They just appear for a bit. I'm sure you're not one of them. I'm, I have to I'm pretty sure of that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that. I, 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 don't, I don't have to worry about it. I'm not looking for a throne. This is one of these high quality albums. I'm not looking for that. I, I'm sure. I'm absolutely positive I'm not one of the 24 elders. I have an evangelist. I won't name his name because it'll make some of you here mad. But he said he was going to be one of the 24 elders. I thought, man, just by that comment alone, you're going to be in the very back of the crowd. He <laughs> can't even make it over the <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried about that. It's up to God to determine who's going to be where. That is, that is really why I'm going to say that is if I make it over there. That's what I thought. I'm going to make sure I get over there. That's what he said. Don't, don't be excited when the demons are set with you. Just be glad your name is written in heaven and your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm not trying to get a big gold medal and trying to find out, you know, how, how awesome it's going to be for me on the other side, how big my gold pile is over there, my, you know, the, the, the lucky charm at the end, and I'm going to have a pot of gold or something over there. I'm not worried about how big my mansion is. You know what? If I'm over there with Jesus, that's what I need. That's I need it. I'm here forever in the presence of the Lamb. Do not worry about your words. Let him figure out the rewards. We are going to go through the fire, and our rewards are going to either be burned up, or they're going to go through the fire and be purified. Because gold and silver becomes more pure when it goes through the fire. But if you build your life with wood, hair, and silver, it's going to burn up. You're not going to have very much left. You'll be saved, but your works will be burned up. The 24 elders and the four living creatures, they fell down and they worshipped. The one who sat on the throne. And they used a word that is a word that everybody knows. Amen! I believe! That's what they were saying. I believe! Yes! The one who is worthy of salvation and glory and honor and power. Yes! Amen! Hallelujah! So now they're saying hallelujah. And now a voice came from the throne. Here again, and I want to help you a little bit with interpreting Revelation and whether you read commentaries or studies on it or whatever. 
People will sit and write 17 pages trying to figure out who this voice is. I don't know who it is. But does it really matter? It's a voice coming from the throne. We know it's not God because it says that voice says, praise our God. So it couldn't have been God saying that. Praise our God. That was, God wouldn't say it that way. But it's a voice that's coming from the throne room. It may have been one of the 24 elders. It may have been one of the living creatures. It doesn't say it. And it's okay. Just leave it alone. If it doesn't say something, don't try to add to it. Don't spend all your time trying to figure it out. Just listen to what they said. A voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God. All you Jewish servants. So there it is again. We saw it at the end of verse 2. We see it again here in verse 5. Jewish servants, all those who fear him, both small and great. This is a phrase that's used quite a bit, by the way, in the book of Revelation, small and great. It means from the least to the greatest. It means everybody. It's, it's, a, it's a term that is used even of the unbelievers when they're getting judged there to the lake of fire. It says the small and the great. But here it's referring to us, the least to the greatest. It's, it's a term that says everybody. The, the, the voice is saying, everybody needs to praise the Lord. Everybody needs to magnify Him. Then here in verse 6, it says, I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering. Now we're going to see this too in Revelation. You see the word there, as? mentioned three times, as it were, as the sound, as the sound. You see that? Or like the sound. In other words, uh, John is, is having trouble describing this massive praise where millions and millions of people are worshiping God. And he says it, it sounds like many waters and it sounds like mighty thundering, but that's not exactly what it sounds like. It sounds like that. He's just saying how awesome and massive it is. And as I was saying, again, the Greek part of the present tense part of it just means he keeps saying it over and over again. Hallelujah! That's what the multitude are saying. For the Lord God Almighty, the Pantocrator, the Greek word, the all powerful one, reigns! Exclamation point. So now that he has the Babylon is removed, all the rebellion has stopped because now God has control over the earth again. The Lord has come. He is the Almighty. So that word omnipotent there, you may have a translation that says Almighty already. I don't know why the New King James uses omnipotent because everywhere else it translates it Almighty. And the same word, Pantocrata, is used at the end of verse 15 there. It says, Almighty Pantocrata, God. So I don't know why they put omnipotent. Maybe this guy, the New King James, God was, he liked Latin or something. But omnipotent, right? Omnipotent means all power, all powerful. Isn't that awesome about our God? He is all powerful. He's the all powerful God. And He reigns. That is the central theme of the Bible, right? Jesus reigns. We're going to see that next time I speak there in verse 16. He's the King of Kings and He's the Lord of Lords. The Lord reigns. Psalm 97, verse 1 says, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the islands be glad. We sing as the scripture chorus, we sing, The Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the earth rejoice, let the people be glad, because we're at that. Oh man, you guys are, you guys, you guys need to get saved. Don't you remember that song? Tell oh, you remember that song, right? Let the Lord reigns. That was back in the 80s. I'm sorry, you guys were not around in the 80s. All right. <clears throat> Psalm 93, verse 1 says, The Lord reigns. Psalm 99, verse 1 says, The Lord reigns. And, and, and we're going to look at this in Revelation in several spots when we get to it. There's different people reigning. Babylon was reigning over the kings of the earth, uh, but now she's going to be thrown down. The Lord's going to reign. The, the martyrs there in, in Revelation uh, 20 are going to reign with the Lord for a thousand years. There's a lot about reigning. It talks about us as believers. We're the kings and priests under God, and we're going to reign on the earth. So there's a lot about reigning, but the one who ultimately reigns and rules is the Lord. He's the one that reigns. He rules and oversees everything. 
Now, think about this for a minute. How many believe that the Lord oversees everything, that He's sovereign, that He has control over everything? It's true, He does. And yet, we just finished seeing in verse 2 the blood of His servant. We just finished at the end of verse 24 of the previous chapter, in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and all who were slain on the earth. And you can go through several verses of the scripture. In fact, if you touch the word blood and you look at it in Revelation, it doesn't just talk about the blood of the Lamb, it talks about the blood of the saints. They're being killed for their witness of Jesus. And yet the Lord reigns. So isn't that a hustle? We can be so free and yet the Lord reigns. So we're not focused and feeling sorry for ourselves when we get stuck or we're persecuted or we're afflicted or we're being afflicted for our testimony for, for Jesus. We're not worried about that. The Lord still reigns because at the end, He writes every wrong. <laughs> so we never worry about that. And this is what we ought to be glad about, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. Be glad, rejoice, and give Him the glory. Why? Because the marriage of the Lamb has come. That's the whole purpose of the creation. God was looking for a wife for the Lamb. He was just a single. He was a single. His Father, Son, Holy Spirit in all eternity. Jesus is eternal, and the Father wanted a wife for the Lamb, for the Son. So we find here the marriage of the Lamb. So where there's a, a wedding, there's also a wedding supper. We're going to get to that in verse 9. So this is a beautiful eternal purpose of God, that God wanted a bride for the Son. And that's why Paul, when he writes in Ephesians 5, he goes when he starts talking about wives, submit to your husbands, husbands, love your wives, and all that. He says, actually, I'm talking about Christ and the church. I'm going to show you a great mystery. I'm talking about Christ and the church. I will present this virgin bride to the Lord in 2 Corinthians 11. Hmm. And what is it? I already told you, his wife has made herself ready. We need to get ready right now. Focus in our life. Character for life. Focus is not working. Focus in our life. We need to get it right. We need to repent. We need to make it right with the Lord. We want to be a bride that's ready. You guys know the, the parable in Matthew 25, right, of the a five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins, right? What is the whole issue? What's the whole issue of the story? The, 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 the bride, the bride did pain. It says the bride did pain. And it says, and the foolish ones were not ready. But the ones who were wise, it says they were ready and they went right into the wedding. <laughs> the ones who were not ready, they didn't get it. They said, out. They said, I'm not going to go. Let it come. You said, you're ready. You better get ready. We're all working on stuff, right? The Lord's dealing with all of us about ourselves and our sins and things in our life. But we need to get ready because the God group is coming. And He's coming for a spotless body and a pure body, not a defiled body, not an unholy body. He's coming for a bride that's going to be glorious. We're not starting to wrinkle. And we ought to rejoice. And we're going to see that as we get into Revelation 22. All of a sudden, he John sees the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And he goes, it's just like the Lamb's wife. The city turns into a woman. It's like Babylon turned into a harlot. The new Jerusalem turns into the bride of the Lamb. It doesn't be heard. It just announces the marriage. It doesn't describe it. It just announces the marriage supper in verse 9. It doesn't describe anything about it. I love that. The Lord is keeping that wedding feast a secret. <laughs> but I want to tell you right now, our God knows how to party and how to throw a party. If you thought you could put together a big wedding with a big feast, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till Father God puts out a feast for the Son. Man. There's going to be all kinds of Italian food. My favorite food. I, I, I don't know. It's not a revelation, so this is off the, off the record, okay? But I think the Lord is going to let you eat your favorite food when you're over there. I do. 
I mean, I, I'm going to have lasagna, spaghetti, pasta, and the other dishes. All of them are going to be right there for me. And don't you guys touch any of them. I think so. I think the Lord is going to allow us to enjoy that. But I, I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know if this is just an imagery that is using. I just know it's going to be awesome. And I want to be at that wedding. I want to be at that wedding. Woo! Ain't going to be no poor after service snack wedding. You ever been, you ever been to one of those weddings? You ever have a lot of money? And it just gets you a roll up? Like a man at the bar, come on over here, I'm about to a hundred dollar gift, and you're giving me a little five dollar, five dollar roll up. That is, that is, the Walmart, that is right. That is not right. I'm taking my gift back. <laughs> no, man, I'm not going to throw a big old stare. This is going to be awesome. No, nah, that's all right, that's all right. Or that's chicken. <laughs> The rainbow. Dear Lord. Yeah, go to Andy Oliver. Get a pile of food or something, man. It'll be so hard. <laughs> nah, I'd be more thankful I even got invited, eh, man? <laughs> now, some of you ain't going to invite me to your, your, your wedding or your, your daughter's wedding or your husband's wedding. Oh, no. Nah. We don't have any new one. If you're sitting a customer at the main center around and your favorite food is manudo, believe me, you're going to eat all the manudo. <laughs> I have not eaten any of your manudo. They're saying, and to her was granted to be arrayed with fine linen, clean and bright. So the fine linen is the righteous act of the saint. What time is it? Okay, I got to finish that thing. You see that? It says it was granted to her. Righteousness is granted to us. We can't earn righteousness. But once we have that righteousness, we got to act it out. See? Righteous act. God gave us his righteousness. Now we got to live right. In the power of the Holy Spirit, in the grace of God, in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he gives us his righteousness, but we now have to live it out. We're laid here in fine linen, bright and clean. That's for us. The fine linen is the righteous act of the saints. Now, notice something. If you go to verse 14 here in the same chapter, these armies that come from the Lord when the second coming, when the heavens are open and the Lord riding on the white horse, it says, and the armies in heaven. Notice how it describes it. Does it say we have weapons and guns? And all that, and all military equipment. No, it says he's clothed in fine linen, white and clean, following him on white horses. I never, I think I rode a horse once in Mexico, the back of a horse. I don't know what it's going to be like to ride a white horse, or if this is just a picture imagery or something, but you and I are going to be riding on a white horse, <laughs> just like his horse. But it talks about here, these armies in heaven are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. It's the same fine linen you find here in verse 8. Fine and clean are the righteous acts of the same. Verse 9, he said to me, and uh, it was an angel. If you look at chapter 22, the last chapter, verses 8 and 9, the same wording you find here is over there. And that was an angel, so we know it was an angel that was speaking to him here. Commanded him, right? Isn't that something? John is on an island in the middle of the uh, Aegean Sea out there in the Mediterranean, and he told him, write this all down. And aren't you glad John wrote it all down? It, it says that 13 times the writers, Jesus and angels, told him, write, write. He didn't say audio recorded, and Brother Rob, I hate, I hate to say he didn't say video recorded. <laughs> You're the video guy. He said, write it down. The most powerful way to teach truth is not by audio or video, it's by writing it down. The most powerful truth ever was written in a book. God wrote it down. 
And that's why I write so much. <laughs> So in 1992, the Lord told me, I want you to write. Start writing. I didn't know at that time what I was doing. I just started writing. And I put out these little newsletters. In fact, this one's on Daniel 927. So if you want it, it's on Daniel 927. So I started writing these newsletters. And I didn't know later on when the Lord said, okay, remember all those newsletters I told you to write? Turn them into chapters and turn them into books. So I started putting them all into books. And then I started... And I want you to translate it all into Spanish, because one of these days you're going to be ministering to Spanish people. So I started taking all of these and we translated them all in Spanish. They all became books, too. <laughs> all the chapters became books. So, and, and, and it, again, it's honor and glory to God. He is a, a skinny Mexican for life. We write letters. As any of you heard my testimony, when I was at UCLA, I took the bonehead English class because I could not write. I didn't know how to write. I was a very terrible writer. And I was embarrassed. And, and, and at UCLA, everybody that was in bonehead English, they called it bonehead English. For all the guys that didn't know how to write, they had a big old purple book. And when you saw somebody with that purple book in their arm, you know, they were bonehead. They were the bonehead. I put that book in the deepest part of my backpack so nobody could see that I was one of the boneheads. And I did. I did that. I was so ashamed. In fact, I, I looked around to see if nobody, when that class was, it was time for that class, I looked around to make sure nobody knew I was going in, and I went in, and I sat in the back. Because I, did, I didn't know how to write. Isn't that amazing that God would use a person that doesn't know how to write to be a writer? <laughs> but I know it was the Lord. Come on, we didn't know anything. <laughs> but they didn't tell me, tell me on the back. You're such a great writer. I said, no, there's, there's a book in my backpack. You don't want to see what it is. But I was in that class. Isn't that something God can take your weakest thing and give it for his glory? So now we have 29 books on Amazon. 15 in English and 14 in Spanish. 29 books. And he needs a bonehead to do it. <laughs> oh, man, you got to be more of a bonehead for God can use you. Amen. Right. Blessed are those who are called. See, before you were the bride, now you're invited as well as a guest. But you're still part of the bride. You just happen to be showing up to the wedding party. And these people that wrote, got this letter... It's a letter. It was a letter that was written. He said, right, I, John, write this letter, the very first chapter. He had to write to them. He was writing a letter, a very long letter, but he wrote them a letter. They were under great persecution. John was on the island of Patmos, chained on the island of Patmos because of the witness of Jesus Christ. He was chained on the island. He was chained. And people doing that, being persecuted and afflicted and chained, you could think, oh, man, that's a fairy tale. We're going to go to a wedding supper? you serious? Where's the God, the Almighty? No. The angel said, these are the true things of God. This is really going to happen. There really is going to be a wedding supper of the Lamb, and we're going to be there. And he falls down, verse 10, at a feet of this angel, and the angel commands him, Greek imperative, see that you don't do that. I'm a fellow servant like you. I'm of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Well, they're witnessing about Jesus. Don't be bowing down, worshiping me. No, he's the worst of God. Another Greek imperative. Obviously, the only one we should worship is God. Because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And brothers and sisters, the minute you get away from prophecy and you start making it into a chart, you're trying to figure stuff out, you're trying to figure out where is this going to happen and all that, you've missed the whole point. The witness is about Jesus. It's about the Lamb who is slain. Father, we thank you right now for the Lamb. <laughs> oh, He is the Lord God Almighty who reigns. And we're going to sing the Hallelujah right now as some people go to the waters of baptism. And we're going to praise you right now because you are the worthy God. All salvation, glory, honor, and power belong to you. And Lord, we want to be ready as the bride to go into the wedding. We want to get ourselves ready so the bridegroom can come 
And we just thank you right now, Father, for this teaching. Help us as we go through. We want to interpret it correctly. We want to get it right. We want to know that the spirit of prophecy is witnessing about Jesus Christ. It's not about a a charge. It's not about what we believe about in time. It's about Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain. We thank you for it right now. Bless our young people right now that are going to the waters of baptism. I'm so proud and happy and glad for Josiah and Raina, Father God. Bless them today in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.